Oh my god, my pocket is still vibrating. Come on, just things go. Oh, yeah. First, we're going to take a big shot. Uh, Hey, now us. Up. I'm joined tonight by the fake Jeffrey Boy, filling in for all the Jeffrey Boy. Now your name really isn't Jeffrey Boy, it is a young man. Check, 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 this will be your mic, that'll be Jeffrey's. Jeffrey has the one with more clarity. And DJ's coming. Yeah, he texted me like 30 minutes ago. What time does it start again? <laughs> oh, DJ. Let's give him a welcome. The People's Palace. The pub with the best grub. Forgetting to throw out Sir Manny's history of this bar. Oh, that's a good one. We'll do that again tonight. Oh, ask how many people are undecided. Well, I don't know about that. I don't, yeah, we'll do it. How many people are Live stream for Jeffrey Boyd. How right many here people? <laughs> Should I ask how many people are here just to eat their dinner? Yeah, how many people actually <laughs> do? <laughs> I don't want to be hard on Jeffrey. But... Do you see the American? Just... They're not including him in any of their candidate surveys, and they keep saying the four major candidates. Wow. That's, that's pretty hard. Hi. Hi. Oh, well, hello. I don't know what to tell all you people out there, but uh, DJ Wilson is tardy, as is our good friend, Jeffrey Boyd. So right now I'm posting up that we're live. I don't know what to tell you. gonna sit here. I did notice I got in a little bit of, let's have a little bit of fun here. I got in a little Twitter spat with somebody because one of uh, somebody in the audience yesterday at uh, uh, the mayoral debate, I was following the uh, hashtag, and they were hypercritical of one of the candidates for pronouncing the state of Missouri as Missouri. And I was kind of like, that they couldn't trust them. Like, you know, this is the kind of divisions that cause us to lose votes out of state when we're trying to get people elected is somehow 
a pronunciation or something as stupid as that. Right. So all of a sudden you can't trust people and there's something wrong with it. I'm like, that's what the country people say about us, you know? And okay. I'm, like, I'm like, yeah, I say Missouri. And so that was, a, that was a contentious point. Yeah. Which uh, Canada dropped the... Oh, it was the only one that's actually lived out state, which is Vida. Vida Cruisin. And I'm sure that somebody will jump on me for even mentioning something. But Clearly trying to pander. Yeah, to the outside. To, to get the vote outside yeah. of the city. <laughs> um, interesting. That's very, yeah, that's very pedantic. I thought you were going to say they were going to, somebody tore into one of the candidates for mispronouncing Gravois, <laughs> LeMay. I think I have all of the bases covered in terms of so uh, tell, tell me a little bit more about the protest. So you went out there on the train? I went out there on the train. Came back in the car. Um, oh, because the trains were just... No, Dana Gray picked me up. Okay. She was leaving. I jumped back. I figured she would have taken the train. She was with her goddaughter, Leanne. They were headed to the confluence. So I tagged along with them. And then we went to three went six. To the confluence? confluence afterwards. The actual confluence. The river, yeah. Okay. Then she had to go to three sixty for a scout for you know pretending as a film scout. So what? She's a film scout? Yeah. Dana Gray. Location scout, yeah. Nice. So I was snapping some pictures of the new Kinger Plaza. Oh nice. Oh you're up at three sixty. Yeah. After the very end of my day, so never quite made it to uh, Bush Center. Huh. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, it was a good day. I just curious what it's gonna feel like when you're on the ground there. I um I also picked up this book at Subterranean. This one. Oh wow, okay. Let me know how that goes. Alright. Uh, Alderman. Jeffrey DJ Wilson Floyd is here now, so we can start. Uh, well, you're looking a little sickly, Jeffrey. I feel like your facial hair. Yeah, I'm pale. I'm really pale. Now, uh, I actually I, I know I need to get you then as a drink. Yes, you do. Yes. You know, the weird thing I work tonight, the uh, building we're in, the pumps broke around noon, so there was no water in the building. So we set me my home to drink. And I stayed because that way he was gone. I actually did something to talk to Right. Yeah, and so I stayed, but it's weird, like, it's all pissed in the urine, and there's no water to flush it. So what? Uh, yeah, you don't really need it. You don't really need it. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and there was enough coffee still, so I was okay. So, it's like, so it's, tomorrow it's bring your own water to work. So, oh, really? Well, no, I, the, the security guard, as I left, said, I'm going to fix my morning. I go, if you don't, I'm going to work. That's fine with me, too. I, I want to go in. Was that whole camel B building? It's a whole building. Yeah, yeah. Whole Not just these West Beach. Uh, unless they turn the water off. I don't know. I don't know that for oh. sure. So I'm Craig, assuming. so Craig Cheatham can't wash his face before he goes on the air. Well, he's gone. Man. Oh, he's, okay. he's actually in Cincinnati. But uh, who, who's the anchor now? I don't even know. I don't you. even. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's uh, Steve Savard, the guy with no neck. Uh, oh, Steve Savard. I remember his, his sports cast. Right, right, right. And. Uh, the other thing on Facebook today, they had Camel B had a poll on where you would favor Trump's band of immigrants. And, and those in favor We made the interview you today. Hey, that's an empty chair. If, yeah. if we chair. don't get any uh, candidates, we will fill some of them. I think you should throw you out in the 15th ward right now. Oh, it's more fun. That is Although, just, just Jennifer know. still? No, not. Huh. I was joking with Steve that we should maybe find some oddball role for me to play in the 15th Ward debate. Moderator. Okay. The, you should moderate. You could stay in the bed and throw your shoe at me. <laughs> right. Just like Bush. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Like, the weird thing is, I mean, I'm still baffled by the real life of Jennifer Florida. I haven't seen it. It's like a new clip. So I don't know if they were wrestling from the last episode. Uh, I'm not sure if they were wrestling from the last episode. I'm not sure if they were wrestling from the last episode. It's a fool theory. Huh? They're trying to trick us. I guess so. I don't know. There's always... 
Actually, counts. No, I counts in both of you. Yeah. Wow. Uh, super well. But I can get. I could probably connect. Okay, because uh, I was, were you there on Sunday? No, I was. Uh, I was shocked. Well, right now I'm looking for Jeffrey Boyd's phone number. No. You were shocked by what? Yeah. Uh, the crowd response to that desert question. I was like, that's a desert question. Yeah. That's somebody from. Yeah, I'm sure they I was there for that. Uh, <laughs> was Lyda Christian's answer. I've never been there, but my kind might go there next year on vacation. No. Uh, Sorry. Nobody was the tip. There was no coronation of the tip queen. Well, well the, one, the one catchphrase I'm using on, whenever I refer to a foreigner, I used to ask her that. Because somebody I was talking to, I was saying, I went to a foreigner, and I said, no, I went to a foreigner, and I said, they say stuff like, you know, women are pretty. That's right. You know, or something like that. It's like, oh, wow. it's, like nothing. it's like you can't argue with them, but they right. don't have no substance. Right. Like, you know, we need a more fair like, way of doing need development. More jobs, let's say. More jobs. We need to look at how we're using incentives, but not really. I don't have any specific ideas about that. Right. Like we're not against this. this, this, this we need more police. Right. So, I mean, I we should do something about homelessness. I, I was surprised by the attendance there. I mean, it was like, plus it's almost, they, one, one report, the TV news, someone said 500, then the holders of it said 1,500. And they're no, making, they, they making they drinks. Set it up for 1,500, right? Is that how many people are set up? Bill, are we live? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, it's kind of like the inauguration. The deal is the organizers of that KLO on Twitter said 15 people signed in. But it didn't, wasn't clear whether they signed in. I walked in, I didn't sign in. Did they sign up? Was it all? See, you know, and then that could be online and they didn't show up. I don't know. Megan Green said it was 2,000. So I mean, like, if anyone out there knows where Alderman Jeffrey Boyd is right now, please call the Royale tip line. At 555 five, five, Royale. That was by far like 10 times more people. Paris still had a full house. It was a small tour. So it was a lot of people. And they were all sort of like from groups that helped sponsor too. Yeah, I thought it was well coordinated. I've never seen that diverse audience together. I think it was this is very much Miller. It's artificial carbon at the same time. Funds are they inject the carbon dioxide. Or is it carbon monoxide? So is Jeffrey gonna be here and does, does he now in CYC basketball we have a ten minute limit. Well, wait, wait, wait 10 minutes for the team to show up. Uh, and four minutes, four minutes, four minutes the mayor. Because I just made it by eight right. minutes uh, yeah. third Saturday, barely. Yeah, what if he doesn't show? Well, then we can have We're a little talk. We do a little yeah, we can talk. Yeah, uh, everyone will ignore us. Exactly. Then we can take questions so, from the audience. What, exactly. What I did at the uh, 2013 Wait, 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 if he doesn't show, do we have to pay for these? Which is kind of mean, but I put placards up for everyone, so anyone who decided not to show up, it was very clear. Like, who, who did you know? Uh, that's me. All right, right. Yeah. I'm going to get like a little cardboard cut out of the for you or something. Well, I mean, I, between, between the four of us here, we have any contact with them at all? Well, I mean, when I notice like this Twitter account, he tweets that we're doing it, and they post on the page, I'm assuming, right? So, although I, I do know that politicians at this time of year are notoriously off schedule. Sure. And that's fine. I'm, I mean, I'm not Bar Barb Geisman gave money to his campaign. Barb really? Geisman. Yeah. A lot of money, too. I mean, you know, it's like $2,000 or something. That's what I have for Not that we need to say anything, 
Say what? Rainford gave him 500 bucks too. Really? Hmm. He, he, he gave uh, Light a 500 also. I'm, I'm, I'm 100, 90% sure. So what? Or is this like a bake sale to pay his mortgage? No. Jack, too, if you want to try that. I don't know if you have it. Wait, is this an XLR? Okay, actually, I have an extra cord if you want to go straight in the pipe. I don't know if this is one Okay. I'm just thinking how I'm going to make it all. How would it work? Yeah, because, okay, what's it going to? It's going out here, picking up the pizza in here. I overthink things sometimes, so it goes in on this 8-inch. Uh, That's listening. So this is the input here? Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. What if I put it like... Is this so visual? Well, it's last year. Yeah, I'm going to double check if I have that wire. Yeah, I think there's going to be some more people. Yeah. Okay. You know, I think I may actually have a converter. Let me, let me double check, okay? Okay. That would be great. Thank you. If not, ooh. You're living on Tulsa time. That's all right. There's one Facebook thing I got, it's at 7 So I was like, well maybe that's it, I don't know. Because I, I thought, like, that's fine with me, I just didn't know for sure which it was. For AJ for Man, he's going out the first big three runners to commit him in the 15th in 1949. Hey, and this run, I have no idea. And the board was called what thing? Columbo. Uh, where's our. Uh, yeah. So, it's a group that sends a lot of people. Basically, a straight ticket from this from the room 200. That's up, right? <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Here for Jeffrey. Here. Put that through there. Yeah. And this will go into the output here. Yeah. So we can just set this like right here. Well, no, it's going to, whatever it's coming through the microphone is. Yeah. So it doesn't even matter where that is. It's in a lot of like sort of. Uh, I mean, if you want, I can test it real quick if you want to cheer. Okay, alright. 
Okay. So much. It'll, it should sound the best. Yes. I've been told that if they don't have um, Jared Kushner's number yet. All I can say is, all I can say is, if the band were announced with one week notice, the band would rush out to our country doing that week. A lot of bad dudes out there. That's, that's dumb. A lot of bad dudes out there. I think I think Roosevelt said that first. I'm not sure. It was an historic reference. Exclamation point. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah.
I like how everybody grumbles, like, oh, I can't make it, I can't make it So, uh, your friend uh, did email me one more time, but the last statement, I don't think it makes any sort of sense.
photo of Steve Bannon as an argument against white supremacy. Then it's okay to have a few minutes of time. Okay, maybe. <laughs> Steve Bannon looks like he knows what time 7 Eleven starts selling ice ups on Sunday. Are you okay? He hasn't called me in like 10 months now, but he, I, he calls me to fill in for somebody else who's sick. I always say, am I the fourth or fifth person to call? Because I know I'm not the first person. Because I tend to argue with all of them, because I don't agree with any of them. And I have a problem with his heart now because I worked with him for times for eight years, for eight years, for eight years. So he was my boss for five of those years before he sold the paper. And I think he's basically, he's not a evil person, he's okay. But when you've worked with somebody for a long time, then you no longer work for them, you get an argument with them, you can really argue with them. Because, yeah, yeah. And sometimes I think I've, I've uh, crossed whatever crossed line there was. And that's fine. But I, what I'm amazed by in that show, two things. One, first of all, it's kind of, 
not surprising that we can never talk about something unless they can argue about it. Yes. So sometimes yes. if you come to a table that is meeting beforehand, and if you see the table, a uh, topic comes up and everyone agrees on it, well, they cannot be again. Right. Yeah. And sometimes really important stuff that might be a good discussion isn't brought up because you can't argue about it. And sometimes they pose taking positions just so they can argue. Yeah. Another thing, and I could say, listen, I understand this to them too. They aren't too well informed, really. Uh, I mean, they, they're in their own little trenches. Because like, you know, Brennan, he has to say certain things that came right to stoke the fire, to the right. call it to call it. And he, these, he leads into Rush Limbaugh and Mark Reardon in the afternoon. So he, he knows his audience is older white people who are pissed off. Mm -hmm. So he, he's kind of, over the years, taken sort of a little bit of a because of that. Or whatever the trade off does. But Alvin doesn't work, and he does a sports um, for he's got five of them very nice years. Yeah. She's a very nice person, I like her, but has nothing to do with me at all. And McCullough, I've known him for a long time. He's sort of a long, not, not because of the cancer, a long time ago, he sort of said he was a predictable take on it. Yes, thank you, because right. I used to read him right. all the time. Uh, there was and I used to write on his like, There's nothing to do here. He, he, he doesn't, and I, this is, you know, the case is, he doesn't cool like to do many comments that requires a lot of things. If it falls into the scenario that he's familiar with, I think he knows what he's going to make out. It's like a crime novel writer for a classic book. Right. Yeah. And, that's, and that's okay in terms of your system uh, of the past, just, and this is not, put it up it's like more an insult for them than a compliment for me. Often, I tell a couple times a month, because yeah. Brennan or Hartman will call me about a topic and you, uh, to figure out what's going on, even though I'm not going to be on the show. That's fine, but sometimes yeah, the dissension is really good. It holds the, uh, it holds the, the, like, the blaster. Yeah, yeah. They kind of work with these assumptions. Yeah, if you're putting a heroin crack, you're just like a metro-link thing. They're staying together. They're just putting a stand. No, the stand is all wrong. You probably won't need the light. Yeah, well, no, I just talked to my. Well, okay, then I don't agree with that person. So a lot of times they're in their own ruts. Yeah. And I will tell you, this is the last thing to tell you because they go over half hour. No. Oh, at least. <laughs> Bren at least. Brennan had a roast of himself. And I bush on Troy Moore about four or five years ago. And he asked me to be one of the roasts. Uh -huh. Okay, which is a big mistake. It's like that old dream that people are always like, the music dream that the bomb. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I totally bombed. It was like, because I was too caustic and I, and I didn't. Uh, but this, okay, this is an example. One of the jokes I told. And the guy in the said, uh, You know that the yeah, media uh, uh, age of the viewers uh, down uh, is uh, sometime uh, in the afterlife. Uh, and, and I said that, and nobody laughed. I noticed that, you know, one time I was on there a few uh, months ago, and after I was off, I got a book that I went down with. And I said, yeah, this has done really well. I'm so proud of you. And I said, thanks, man. I hung up the phone. And I knew I was going to find my family back in 1968. I thought it was eyes out. And I knew it was bad. And I looked out the audience, and they're all going to go into that anyhow. So it was like, it was kind of like, yeah, it was kind of like, it was like, I should have known my audience better. And so, but that's the demographic. They do, but the other scary thing is, a lot of people watch it. I, the last time I was on was like six, eight months ago. And I went to Crazy Diner because uh, my granddaughter was at the basketball game afterwards on the second day. So I went to Crazy Diner and it was totally yeah, strange. Like, hey, I swear I was going to tell you. You could be the worst. I feel sorry for you. Like that. Then another time, a couple weeks ago, somebody came to me another basketball game. Uh, and she was talking about you know, the nose. And I'm old enough and I forget a lot of things. Right, right. So I usually just play along and right. that's just going to come out at some, some point. Right. And then he said something like, oh, when you were on Downing Street. Oh, ah. Uh, 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 well, see, I remember your face. Yeah, and yeah, and I, I, see. I, I, I don't watch it. Talk to them about it. I am, I'm like, I've always been passionate and rapidly interested in national politics, but never a lot of the local politics.
November, I just determined that that's where I'm going to start putting the my local, energy the local stuff, fashion. The local stuff has more energy than that. Yeah. 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 Just finished reading a book about Robert Moses in New York City. Not, not the power broker. Power broker. Oh, you finished the book? I finished the book. Oh my God. I finished the book. I've had the book for years. I've never, I read parts of it. I don't know what it's Oh no, it's a genius. Oh no. And I was just like, holy shit. How did this and he's, that's what I feel like asking for the I went to the Merrill today yesterday. I did too. Yeah. I've lived in the city for five years. I was in the county. What about? I grew up in the city. I knew I never belonged there. Are you kidding Yes, I am. I am a sustaining member. Well, you need to email me or call me there. That, that's me. That's it. I'm not a guy. I'm on... I was on radio, but not a podcast that's been on so like, since 2015. Radio was on 2001, but I'm always, in fact, I'm, I got a book of Jeffrey for a video that shows up uh, for a podcast. I had, uh, I have to start on in a couple weeks. I have every, I have it's an all-the-matic candidate. And that's what I did this time. I got four all-the-matic candidates. Here he is. I had four all-the-matic candidates. Two on two different shows that are running for the first time because I mean that's going to be there's really a potential for a lot of new elementary candidates. Okay, so, so so I will email you and you Please. will point me to the podcast. Please, I'm very very interested. Thank you very again. much, Barbara Olley. Okay, Barbara. Barbara. Thank you. Okay, cool. Yep. Agony. 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 Yeah, I got two. I can log in from my parents if those are available to people. Oh my god. Good. 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 It's so quiet in here. <laughs> well, the man walked in, that's why. Fashionably. Check, go. check. Welcome down, everybody. I'm sure uh, you, can sit in the middle seat. you are not oh, here for the uh, aldermanic close ups. I'll give you a little heads up. But uh, every Monday <laughs> between uh, January and the end of February, for the most part, uh, we have been bringing Crawler in. Crawler and Fall, let's work on this count. Okay. So, so I should be One over. Yeah. One over. Should no. Jeffrey be over that you're here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So just uh, wanted to let everybody know what we are up to. If you uh, are coming here just to enjoy the dining, continue to enjoy the dining. And if you want to listen, you can. If not, just ignore us. But uh, we'll have a very good time tonight. Uh, this is being live streamed. And. Uh, Oh, and also, we, you guys will probably talk more than better than I can. So, but I will be going around with note cards if you have questions for uh, Jeffrey Bell here. I'm just going to hand this. Well, you got, you can talk. All right. Yeah, we're good. All right. Good evening, and welcome to another mayoral close-up at the Royale. Our first close-up, where the candidate walked his way through the crowd. <laughs> Everyone in expectations. Great. Um, take take note. Uh, Louis Reed and Antonio French are next two and last two. Uh, that would be on the 13th for Louis Reed and on the 20th next month for Antonio French. Same time, 6.30 at the Royale. Um, also up front, we are posting the videos and uh, audio from this event. The videos are on YouTube and the podcast version is up for Tashara Jones tomorrow for Lida Cruson. That includes bonus commentary from myself, Mike Lallan, and DJ Wilson to my right. If you like to hear us, John Steve Smith joins in every now and then when he can. So Bill Streeter, did Bill Streeter as well. So Bill Streeter here is our technical guru making this all possible. Just give a brief recognition to him. And away we go. So... We have some note cards out here. I've already collected a few They're in my pocket. So the format, for those who have not been out, is this is not a gotcha type event. This is an event where we try to get the candidate to open up and talk at length and in detail about important issues. So let's be nice, DJ. We'll try. We'll try. We'll try. Um, and following many... Um, mayoral uh, debates including yesterday's at St. Louis University there seems to be even more to talk about every day plus the quarterly MEC filing so 
Lots of information, more more every day. And we're about what? Th about 35 days or so from the actual prime? Yeah, right or so. <laughs> right around there. 38 days, so we're getting close. Um, and just up front, a quick historical factum about this room. In 1949, a young man named Alfonso J. Cervantes at this tavern celebrated his first electoral victory as committee man in the 15th ward of the city of St. Louis. Tavern is now in the 10th ward, but Cervantes went on to be two-term mayor of the city. His memoir is a classic, Mr. Mayor. One of two mayors of St. Louis who've written their memoirs. Maybe Francis G. Slay will find time in retirement to turn out another volume. So, anyway, I'm Mike Lau. I'm a teacher at Washington University, historic preservationist. DJ Wilson here to my right, veteran journalist, Roustabout. Geezer. Geezer, Geezer that's right. coach, that's right. guru, what, you wanna... we'll start things off. <laughs> no, I was, I was going to say, I was just on the uh, my phone texting a mother of a fifth grade basketball player to make sure I get his birth certificate tomorrow for the ID. So <laughs> there are priorities here. And, All right. Uh, you know, Sorry, DJ. Well, they, have, they, they have to be street legal, you know, to play. And that's, uh, okay, uh, yes, as uh, Michael said, this is accessible in all sorts of ways. I also, uh, I am the host of a podcast called Collateral Damage on Kitty at Jex. I've, in the last couple of weeks, I've had four aldermen on, first time running for office in the 5th, the 19th, the 3rd, and I'm missing one. The 15th? No, not the 15th. 16th. Well, see, I, should, I shouldn't start sentences I can't finish. Anyway, it's all the Collateral Damage. Uh, and it's, you reach out through Collateral Damage Podcast dot KD, KDHX.org. Uh, I also, um, we'll have uh, Michael ask the first question, okay? I, I want to say that Jeffrey and I go back a long way. Remember Jeffrey? We do. Oh, yeah. I, when I, I first got involved in politics, pretty much. I was uh, and the staff writer at the Riverfront Times from 95 to 2003, when, which is when I got whacked. But um, that was back when the, the days of Kenny Jones. That's right. We'll go into that later. <laughs> we'll, uh, but Michael had the first question. All right, and Jeffrey and I go back a ways, too. When I worked at the Landmarks Association of St. Louis, worked on historic preservation projects for him, the 22nd Ward, including a historic district down Martin Luther King Drive, the only part of Martin Luther King Drive still to this day to be listed as a historic district. But before I ask a question, we are going to give Jeffrey about three minutes to introduce himself to this crowd. Okay. So opening statement, well, in all fairness. And we can, DJ, I can go back to texting. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I want to send a shout out to my wife, Patrice, in the back. We've been married 26 years. And my oldest daughter, Brittany. A little bit about who Jeffrey Boyd is. I've had the pleasure and the honor of serving my country for over 23 years. I'm a retired Master Sergeant with the United States Army. I have a master's degree in business administration. I've put it to good use. Against all odds, my wife and I have opened up two small businesses in my neighborhood on Martin Luther King Drive, Michael. And that nice historic district is the best place auto sales and the best place event space. 5736 is the location just east of Goodfellow. I have served as alderman of the 22nd Ward for over 14 years. My wife and I made a conscious decision about 24 years ago to move back into the neighborhood that we grew up in. I met her when she was 10, I was 12. It was a vibrant neighborhood. We had the Wellston Shopping District, J.C. Penney's, Wool, uh, Woolworths, Tom McCann Shoes, and we wanted to come back and make a difference in that challenging neighborhood. So we rehabbed a four family flat into a three family and we started our journey to provide quality, affordable housing for people in our neighborhood. Here's what I wanna do for the city of St. Louis. I wanna use my gifts and talents. I wanna transform the city of St. Louis. I envision the city of St. Louis as a destination place where people feel safe coming to the city of St. Louis, where tourism is up, where all these vacant buildings and vacant lots owned by the city have been packaged together and offered up to a developer to rehabilitate our neighborhoods, hundreds of homes at one time. I envision a police force that's adequately staffed, well-trained, and reflects the diversity of our community. And that is adequately trained in diversity as well as de-escalation. You see, having worn a uniform, I can understand how sometime in a split second or a moment, things can get out of hand. 
but we need a police force that's trained in de-escalation so that they can experience a tough situation, but they diffuse it in a way that everybody goes home. Our children all attend or have are attending St. Louis Public Schools. My oldest daughter is a junior at Metro. My grandbaby is in pre-kindergarten at Washington Montessori. We have been invested in our St. Louis Public Schools for over 20 something years. I'm proud of St. Louis Public Schools and I'm so excited as a parent that they're fully accredited. But we're involved parents. And here's what I want to be as mayor. I want to be the chief advocate and cheerleader for St. Louis Public Schools. I want to go to Jefferson City and work with our state legislatures and make sure that we have simple legislation to protect our children on school buses. I want to see seat belts on all school buses. I want to see aftercare and before care expanded in our schools so that children can get the extra academic excellence and, and, and tutoring and educational experience that they deserve so they can achieve academic excellence. I want to make sure that pre-kindergarten is a universal and accessible to all children. I want to work with the homeless. Having served as an executive director of two nonprofit housing organizations, I understand the value of our nonprofit industry. And I want to work with the nonprofit industry and our religious leaders to make sure that we tackle the homeless crisis. It's time for St. Louis to rise, and it's time for St. Louis to have a leader that rolls his arms, his rolls sleeves up, and get out there and reach the people and talk to the people and bring businesses and entities uh, to our community. We have an opportunity with cybersecurity, with high tech industry, construction, and healthcare to bring good jobs, quality jobs in our neighborhoods so that we can all rise and have good salaries and buy some of these homes that we're gonna build throughout the city. All right, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, <clears throat> several of the candidates running for mayor have um, voting records at the Board of Aldermen are in other places that they've served on, like President Reed on the Board of Estimate and Apportionment. So we can look into those records and see a little bit about what these candidates have actually done. And sometimes in a race, we have a lot of talk, right? What people are saying they're going to do. Just looking at the current candidates, um, we have, you know, Alderwoman Crewson with the record where she's mostly been voting with the majority. Very few times you'll find her on the, the losing end of these votes. And Alderman French maybe on the other extreme, often then one or two vote uh, at the other side of an issue like Paul McKee's uh, Northside Regeneration. Uh, your record, maybe a little more in the middle, um, you have notably dissented on the football stadium and other bills. And rather than tell you what your record might be in my eyes, I'm just kind of wondering what if we look into Jeffrey Boyd's record on the Board of Aldermen, what kind of person do we see? What kind of leader? Well, first of all, I think you're going to see a leader that's thoughtful, that put a lot of consideration into how he wants to vote and how he wants to represent the city. I'm very interested in increasing the quality of life of St. Louisans. So you will see that I have a voting record that supports that. All right. Uh, this is a standard question asked all the candidates, but if you think about it, it's, it's a telling one if you, if, you, if you go to it. You're replacing, if you become mayor, someone who's been mayor for 16 years. Name something that you're different than Francis Slayon, and name something you're the same as Francis Slayon. What, what, something that you look at him and say you're critical of and something you're supportive of. How would you be different or the same? Well, here's one big difference um, between me and the current mayor. I believe I am more willing to take on the tough challenges. When I look at North St. Louis and our distressed neighborhoods across the whole city, there has been minimal attention. I am someone who has a vision that sees opportunities. So I would put in place, give you a good example of what I would do to help make our neighborhoods safer and rebuild them at the same time. Because we know when development goes up, crime goes down. Again, the city of St. Louis has all of these vacant lots. One third of the 22nd Ward is vacant lots and vacant buildings. We need a mayor who has a vision, a mayor that's gonna package all these lots. Take I would take three of the top distressed neighborhoods across this city and I will put a plan together and I would make developers react to that plan. We will put a request for proposal out there and make them compete and provide whatever incentives that we need in order for them to compete. Our problem with city government is we have no real vision. 
We're oftentimes reacting to developers' plans instead of having developers react to our plans. So that is one thing that would set me apart because that's outside the norm. I'm not a status quo politician. I'm not an establishment politician. How are we the same? I think we have St. Louis' best interests at heart. The difference is, how do you go about being a mayor for the whole city instead of being perceived as a mayor for certain sections of the city? And I think that's a critical difference. On the issue of uh, development, um, one of the largest projects uh, on North St. Louis, controversial, of course, to say the least, is Paul McKee's Northside Regeneration. Okay. A case that seems an instance where the developer has the city in a position of reacting to his vision rather than the other way around that you've sketched out. On the board, though, you have voted mostly in favor of bills related to that project. Do you assess where that project stands today as a success or a failure or something in between? Well, well certainly it was a process that was flawed from its beginning. And I think that's why it ran into a lot of problems. It kind of snuck up on the people and the people resisted that. And when you, when you disrespect a community, you're gonna get pushback. And that's what happened in the early stages. And then the project got caught up in court and it just snowballed into a bad situation. But I have stood in support of the Northside Regeneration Project because there was an area of slum and blight and we need to do something about it. And so I wanna see something done. It seems like it's been at least seven years since that process started and we haven't seen anything yet, but I'm hopeful and I'm here and I support a couple of board bills for some development to start that I would hope that would ignite. Now, I think uh, Paul McKee ran into a unique situation with the whole NGA experience because it was very important that we keep NGA in the city of St. Louis. So now what I see happening around that particular site in that area, there are gonna be hundreds of homes built up around that area. And it certainly is my hope that there are affordable homes where everybody have equal access to purchase in one of those homes. So at the end of the day, I see a lot of hope for that community over there. All right, DJ. Uh, also, we have, if you have any questions, we have some that have been submitted already, but we have index cards here. You can scribble your questions down. One of the things I remember in thinking about today was you told me this years and years ago, and I, I, I probably might get it slightly wrong, but it, 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 it is an example of what happens when you're an alderman. You said to me once, and it was in passing, it wasn't like you were making a big deal of it. You said, yeah, I sit down at these tables with somebody, and the, there's two people, and one of them's getting paid by the other person to sit down and talk to me. And I think you meant like people hire somebody to be like a go-between to get to the alderman. What's it like? dealing with crap like that, basically? Well, first of all, once I figured out, that was in my early days hey, oh, yeah, of being was, an alderman. Yeah, yeah. And when I figured that out, I would talk to people, let them know, look, I'm accessible. You don't have to go through anybody to get to me. Matter of fact, I got an attitude about it. I didn't appreciate that. Right. And then I distanced myself from people that are like that because I'm a guy, again, I've been 23 years in the military. What's very important to me is integrity. And I don't deal with people that wants to get paid for favors. It's like a hookup. You know, I here's the kind of alderman I am. If you want to do development in my ward, I'm going to give you 130% of who I am. I'm going to help you cut through the red tape because we need good development. And I think when you have legislators that are paid off to do their job, they basically marginalize their community because so much is not being done because sooner or later that relationship falls apart because it becomes a, a currency exchange. And I'm not interested in that. I can't help elevate the life of people in my neighborhood if I'm that type of character. All right. Um, so on your, uh, in your platform, on your website, um, you talk about auditing the departments if you become mayor. And I wonder, since you've been on the Board of Aldermen, the Board of Aldermen votes on at least some of the budget, if there's one time you've been able to make an amendment or intervene to prevent wasteful or excessive spending. Well, I had an opportunity to sit on Ways and Means for probably eight years. And when we went through the budget process, what I found was it was a shell game. 
you know, they, they, they funded a person from this account and, and you thought that $80,000 was that salary. And then you look and it's like, oh no, it says 0.7. And then you find out that it's funded in a different account somewhere else. Then we found that certain services or contracts were hidden. So what I was able to do, because I'm very passionate about forestry. In my neighborhood, we have overgrown vegetation that would go four feet high sometime. And so I've always been able to find some money and shift it over to forestry so that we can have more people out in the field cutting grass. Because I'm gonna tell you something, when you live in a neighborhood where the grass is four, four feet high, that's depressing. No one can get excited about that. And we haven't done a good job in the city of St. Louis of adequately funding departments that can really make a significant impact in the psyche of people. You know, we deserve quality living conditions. And so I'm always looking and I often have found money hidden somewhere else in the budget to fund great uh, departments like the forestry department. Well, let's go back in time a little bit. When you first ran for Alderman, I was with the RF RFT then, mm -hmm. and you ran what I would have to describe, let's use a, a, a vague term, a very colorful Alderman, Kenny Jones. And he, you, were, you ran against him a couple times, as I recall, and you didn't give up. Tell me why you really wanted to be an Alderman then and how difficult that was then, because Kenny was pretty entrenched at the time. Yes, he was. He was an established, um, he was part of the establishment. He had been there over 19 years. I like to think and tell people I ran against Kenneth Jones and won, but the reality is I ran against James Ozier and won. But we're going to back up, and I'm glad you brought this up, uh, DJ, because I remember you coming out and we were going around the ward, and, and I said, you know, I, I, I just rather be in jail than have to live under this leadership. <laughs> And as I was frustrated, my wife and I have put our heart and our soul into our community. And we just did not see much hope under that current leadership. They weren't empowering people. As an alderman and as a leader, it's my responsibility to empower people so that they don't have to depend on me, so that they can empower other people and we can grow a healthy community. And so I ran as an independent candidate, basically a neophyte. I was well known in my neighborhood in Hamilton Heights, but I wasn't really well known throughout the whole ward, which happened to be a new ward. But I gave him my all and I canvassed. It was about a six week special election and I lost by 105 votes as an independent candidate. And not only did I lose by 105 votes, I lost $5,000 of my wife's money. Uh -oh. Look out. But I was determined that I wanted to do something. See, in the, in the Army, we don't complain about it, we be about it. And so I was taught if there's a task to be done, just get it done. But I didn't give up. See, I lost by 105 votes, but I didn't give up. It was a special election. And I decided that I would run again in March, in the March primary. And I'm proud to say I won by an official eight votes. <laughs> Okay, so eight votes. So don't tell me your vote don't count, okay, because your vote does count. And then I'll tell you what was interesting, DJ, about that. Every race in the city of St. Louis had been called by 10 o'clock. Every race but the 22nd Ward. And back then, ladies and gentlemen, we had punch cards. So you had the hanging chads and you had all that kind of stuff. And I just kept saying, you know, they're still in. They're trying to steal the election. And back then, the Board of Election didn't have a good reputation. So I was, I was real nervous and I was real concerned. And I was like, man, something's, some, something's not right. But then when I went to sleep, I had put it in God's hand. And I said, if it's, if it's his will, it would be me. So about 1.20 in the morning, I got a call from a good buddy who said, man, you won. You won by nine votes. And I was like, you know, all excited. My wife and I, we hugged each other. We were just too excited. But then we had to have a recount. And because of the hanging chads, somehow I lost the vote and he gained the vote. But at the end of the day, a win is a win. <laughs> wow. The story from the past, but I'm kind of thinking it could be a foreshadowing of, uh, what is it, 38 days from now? It seems like eight votes could call this crowded election. Obviously, 
you're you're here to make the case for uh, Jeffrey Boyd. You're running. You're a candidate. You're serious about this. If you were not running, is there any of the other candidates you would have considered supporting? Mm, do I have to answer that question? No. <laughs> you ain't gonna do nothing, man. It's up to you. Uh, I, I, I'm gonna take the fifth. All right. Just throwing it out there. Then I'm gonna follow up with um, the other, some of the other candidates, including Tashara Jones, have called for term limits for the office of mayor. Um, I kind of fall into the camp of, we have term limits. Every four years we get to vote. Francis Slay is the first mayor to get as far as he's gotten. AJ Cervantes, who I mentioned earlier, was denied a third term. He lost re-election. So it doesn't always work uh, toward the advantage of the um, incumbent if there's a well-organized uh, opponent. Should there be term limits for mayor, alderman, or any other public offices? That's a good question. Should it be term limits? I'm inclined to say, you know, maybe there should be term limits of, of mayor, um, but then you open the Pandora's box to suggest that there should be term limits for aldermen. And we see what term limits in our state legislature has done for the city of St. Louis. It has really set us back 20 years. And so, and I was one of the people that said, hey, yeah, term, I couldn't get a hold of my state representative, never returned phone calls. I was like, throw them out. Let's do term limits. Democrats were in control of Missouri before term limits. So we really have to be careful whether or not term limits is good. And I thought it was quite interesting, and, you know, that Ms. Jones brought that up, and I'm not sure if I believe her. I mean, this is the same candidate that told us that parking has no business in the treasurer's office, and she would work with state and local officials to move it over to city government, but she's currently proud to be the parking supervisor. So. You mentioned that you run two businesses in your ward. Tell me about what it's like to run a business in the city and why you chose to run your businesses in your own ward. Sure. Number one, I chose to open up businesses in my own ward because I wanted to inspire developers to see the vision that I see and to follow my lead. I'm certainly not opening up businesses to fail. And I'm not opening up businesses just to be doing something. I am serious about making money for myself. Let's, let's keep it real. I'm a, as a business owner, I'm in the business of making money, but I also provide an opportunity for other people. So we opened up the event space. Our real goal and our real vision is to see an event space where we have live entertainment, where people can come have celebrations and meetings. We can have comedy shows, jazz, you know, whatever genre of music. Also, I decided, hmm, I have this huge 18,500 square foot building, and it's probably not going to be rented every day. So I decided that to maximize the use of my parking space. So we decided that we would just sell about four or five cars. We'd line them up across uh, the front parking lot and try to get two bites at the apple. Now, certainly being a business owner can be a little stressful because you have to sell product. So I know what it's like, you know, to have to pay some bills and maybe you win a month and then sell a product. So. We've experienced some of that, but I'm proud to say that we haven't had to come into our own pocket and pay any bills lately. So the business is going well, and we are fortunate enough that we haven't really done a lot of advertising, but through word of mouth, you know, we get a lot of customers coming in and want to rent the place. As a, as a business owner and an alderman, you may be well suited to answer my next question. We've asked all the candidates this question in fairness. Um, or I have anyway. Um, some business owners complain that there are not there's not one business code for the city, but they find sometimes there are 28 business codes with individual aldermen sometimes creating spot legislation to restrict bars opening, like on Cherokee Street for many years when Craig Schmidt was in office. One of the issues that sent him packing and off the board, it seems like. Um, other aldermen have used spot legislation to restrict what's con perceived as nuisances, close streets for other businesses, close alleys. Some candidates have suggested we might need to create citywide standards. I think most business owners would love it if it was more predictable, but maybe there's a reason for being local. If your mayor and bills come out of the Board of Aldermen from one ward impacting citywide policy in just that ward, what will you do? Well, first of all, in the city of St. Louis, 
the champion for each ward is their alderman. And it's a tough job, believe it or not. It's a very tough job. And you have neighborhood groups and associations and people that want to have certain standards. And I think that's okay because politics is local and people have a right to shape their community in the way that they see it. That's part of democracy as well. Now, I happen to be an alderman that love businesses, that support and embrace businesses. I'm the one that wants to remove all the barriers for you to come. But at the end of the day, I do have to answer to the people that vote for me. And that's a challenge. You know, you can't just go against the people's will because then you're not representing their best interests. So you always have to walk this fine line on what the greater good is. And at the end of the day, as a mayor, it's incumbent upon you to listen to your constituents. Well, Michael usually asks a question about the sentence, but I'm gonna approach it from a slightly different angle. You can ask another question, that's all right. There's been a lot of heat on too many abatements, too many tax TIFs, tax increment financing, tax, uh, transportation development uh, districts, etc. And one of the things that the root cause of it, I think, and uh, is automatic courtesy, is that you don't want to step on somebody else's toes. If you got a development in your ward and you want a TIF for it or a TDD or whatever, that you don't want to, other people don't want to say no to you because they'll, you'll say they'll say no to you next time. And what, what that leads to, I think, and we'll get into the soccer stadium in a minute, I'm sure, but not necessarily this question, but if you total up all the incentives that have been given in the last few months to the foundry, the armory, the uh, development at Del Mar and, and Skinker, the uh, Jefferson uh, downtown, Ballpark Village too, it's over $90 million. So it dwarfs the soccer stadium, really, in terms of well, that's all in the pipeline going to happen. How does automatic courtesy enter into these kind of development deals? And have you used that as an example to oppose another alderman's incentive program without fear of getting payback for yourself? Yeah, automatic courtesy is, is very important, and it happens a lot. Oftentimes, you want to support you know, what that alderman is doing in his or her ward. Um, but I, I, what is it, as it relates to tax abatement and the TIFs, I think you're finding that we as aldermen are starting to pay more attention to it. Uh, we're working closely with St. Louis Development Corporation to, to come up with a matrix and a scoring system and, and really analyzing is that an appropriate amount? Does it really need it? I am currently chairman of the Neighborhood Development Committee. So certainly I'm paying more attention to whether or not tax abatement is appropriate, whether it's you know 10 years or five years, 20 years or whatever they're asking. Is it really appropriate? Does it help the city of St. Louis? Is it really eliminating slum and blight? And in some cases, we're finding that it may not need 10 years. So maybe we'll cut it down to five. And we have been known to negotiate with different aldermen to cut it down. Um, Tax abatement and TIFs, I tell you though, is, is really designed for neighborhoods that look like mine. I mean, it's, it's really slum and blight. And I think that for the sake of just getting along far too long, we have just been supporting our uh, colleagues to, to give TIFs and tax abatement in areas that really don't need it. And, and here's, the, here's the challenge. We have spoiled developers in the city of St. Louis. I talk to developers from out of town and they go to tax, really? They're surprised that we're giving tax abatement. So we give, we do give it away like candy, and we do need to be more responsible. And as mayor, what I would want to do is make sure that we put a comprehensive plan together for the city of St. Louis, and we look at what areas tax abatement and tips are appropriate. See, if we make developers react to our plans, here's an example for you, uh, IKEA. Now, when Akia decided that they wanted to move to the city of St. Louis, we have this site at I-70 and Goodfellow. It had been vacant for a long time. We basically cleaned it up. It's right off the highway. It's a hundred some thousand cars that pass by every day. Why wasn't Akia directed to move that way? Look what it would have done to that community how it might have jump-started development in that community. Do you want to answer that question? But it, it was the easy thing to do because of Cortex. And there was a lot of, you know, 
you know, big wigs that were saying, hey, this is what we want and this is what you're going to do. But see, that's where real leadership come into play and say, OK, DJ, I know that's what you want to do. And that's the easy route to take. However, this is what I really need you to do. And if you want all of that TIF money, if you want all the tax abatement, you need to come over here. Because if not a Kia, it'll be somebody else. That was the, the, the munitions plant, wasn't it? Yes. Well, yeah, it seems like the same question could be asked why that site was never in the running for NGA either. Um, on the subject of strategic planning and comprehensive planning, I the left on the wall here is the great St. Louis bank robbery poster. And I'm thinking about that because that building, the Southwest Bank, has just gone through several months of arduous political processes with the, the current owner selling it to a developer wants to put a Walgreens in there and do all kinds of work to the site. Um, but the process seems far from streamlined. Uh, the Preservation Board approved the latest version of the plan after denying it, but only on the stipulation that the Board of Public Service approved curb cuts sought for the project and the Zoning Board of Adjustment approve a conditional use variance from the zoning of that lot. All of that raises um, the fact that we don't really have a comprehensive urban plan for the city more recent than the current plan on the books, which was passed in 1947. So when we're trying to deal with the situation like that, the neighborhood groups ask one question. You know, the city officials, the preservation board can only rule in the historic buildings. The BPS can only rule in the curb cuts. Nobody's really looking at the big picture. Right. And no wonder Alderman Conway was just kind of scratching his head hoping nobody called about it. But he did have to do the answer to it. Uh, I think he, he just kind of threw his hands up in the air. And a lot of that's happened again and again. Well, we don't really know what to do in this kind of case, right? So we just either pass the buck or push what the developer wants. If we're going to streamline that, we need a strategic plan, a comprehensive plan. You call for that on your website, it seems. Mm -hmm. What do you envision and how do we get there? And in the end, what process will we end up with? Well, first of all, I would want to double the size of the planning department and start there. Mm -hmm. It's a shame. In city government, basically, your planning department is your research and development department if you were in a corporation, right? But we have a very thin staff. I think it may be five people, and that's not helping the city of St. Right. Louis. So the first thing I would do is increase the planning staff. We would not have done the Arlington Grove project, that $34 million project, had it not been from Don Rowe, Daphne Moore, those great professionals from the planning department that had been with me for almost 10 years working on that plan. And we went through several iterations without any professional consultants. It was just the planning department, the city of St. Louis, on coming up with what it could look like. So we get this planning department adequately staffed. And then we go neighborhood by neighborhood and we talk to the residents about what do they see their community looking like? Ten years from now, what do you see? What kind of businesses do you see in this neighborhood? You know, what kind of homes do you see in this neighborhood? And we take it neighborhood by neighborhood and we really make sure that we get community input. Now, there are some neighborhoods that are strong and you'll get a hundred people to come out and provide their input. But then you have some neighborhoods that I represent who have given up oftentimes, a lot of people have given up. They may only be four or five people. So we have to be aggressive at going out, making sure that we're knocking on doors and pulling people to these meetings and encouraging them and getting them excited about a plan. And so you put all these neighborhood plans together and you get people to buy into it so that when you get someone that says, I wanna give you a soccer stadium, you have to look and say, hey, that's exactly what we've been wanting. We talked about that five years ago. Or not. Right? But that's part of having a comprehensive plan. And the comprehensive plan is not just about the brick and mortar. It's also about public safety. If you're looking at our street grid, is it appropriate for the neighborhood? Do we have adequate lighting? So it's huge. It's a huge undertaking that would probably take at least two years, but we have to do it. We have to do the tough stuff. Otherwise, we would continue to do the same stuff that we've been doing year after year. Okay, we're going to some questions in the audience uh, submitted. Uh, we're reading these now. This is uh, submitted by 
350 STL. 350 STL. What is your biggest concern for the St. Louis area pertaining to climate change, and what specific changes will you make to city policy to uh, combat c climate change in a way that is equitable to all St. Louis communities? Well, f first of all, my children had asthma. So I think, you know, the air pollution and having somebody monitor our air pollution is very important. And if there are businesses that are emitting certain pollutions that are harmful to our air, we need to make sure we're on top of that. We also need to make sure that we become more sustainable as far as our uh, renewable energy. We need to push for solar panels and other alternatives for generating energy. I would wanna make sure that all government buildings are first of all, very energy efficient. And wherever appropriate, we start installing solar panels so that we can have cost savings and help save our environment. And also, I'm a big proponent of trees. You know, I want to plant trees. We've planted probably 30-something trees, you know, about 60-something trees in Bear Brothers Park. We put a nice walking trail out there so people can get out and exercise and, and feel good about being out in some clean, open space. So we planted trees. And so those are some small strategies that I would work on. But I would also say that I'm probably not the smartest person in St. Louis. So I will make sure that I work with the experts in the field and come up with a plan for that as well on how we can make St. Louis a better St. Louis. Next question from the audience. We already alluded to this earlier. Do you support the current uh, legislation for a soccer stadium west of Union Station? And if not, what are your development goals? What could be the development goals for that site? Well, first of all, when I when I first thought about the soccer stadium, is this something that you know we should really do? I, I had about three questions. Number one, does it really create meaningful, impactful jobs for city residents? And, and can people in my neighborhood be employed? And people across the city, can they and will they be employed? Number two, does it really generate enough revenue where we can give pay raises to city employees and provide better service to our constituents? And number three, does it fit within our overall plan for the city? We can't just do a soccer stadium and boom, there it is. You know, what other, what can we leverage off of that to stimulate economic development and jobs somewhere else in the city of St. Louis? I do support the people having the right to vote because I think we empower people in that manner so the decision could ultimately and should ultimately rest with the people and let the people speak. And, I, and from what I'm hearing, I don't know, people don't seem to be excited about it. But it's good to have a voice and it's good to be able to vote on that issue. Okay, you touched on this earlier, but this question of the audience is, what incentives will be given to homeowners, people that own homes already, I take that to mean, or small businesses to improve their homes, home improvements, or start small businesses to develop vacant lots and homes. You spoke about the, your, uh, the amount of vacant lots and homes you have in your ward, but what specifically can you do for people that already own homes to fix their homes up, or people that could move into these houses or start small businesses? Okay. Well, here's what we've been able to do in the 22nd Ward. We certainly have a, a lot of homes that have deferred maintenance. And so what we've done is we've worked with the Community Development Agency. We've put them in the home repair program. Unfortunately, the waiting list is super long. But what we've done with the nonprofit, which is Hamilton Heights Neighbor Organization, what we've been able to do is go out and seek additional funding, grant funding from other sources, and created many grants where it's like two or three thousand, in some cases four thousand dollars, that we can help homeowners who are struggling with maintaining their homes. And as a mayor, I would advocate for doing more of that. You know, we've engaged organizations like Rebuilding Together, who have come in, as well as Habitat to help people, to leverage, you know, home repairs. Uh, I'm so proud of an organization that I support for young people, it's called Harambe, where they train 12 years old up to 18 years old on how to tuck point. In my neighborhood, we have some good brick buildings, but paying to tuck point a two-story building is quite expensive. So we have these young people through the Harambe program in the summertime, they're getting paid a stipend, and they're learning how to tuck point from mixing mortar to grinding out joints and buttering them back. And they do a professional job. They've gotten so good that the nonprofit organization had to start a for-profit corporation. And now they're hiring these young people to get 
15, 16, 17 hour, uh, uh, jobs making 16, 17 dollars an hour. So it's a phenomenal story. Um, I'm very sensitive to providing support in our community for people who are struggling to make home repair. We're also making sure that they're partnering with other urban organizations like the Urban League to get weatherization services. When it comes to small businesses, one of the uh, programs that the city has, I think is a great program, is the facade program, where they can help businesses transform the whole front. We've seen some buildings go from just this ugly looking box to a beautiful building with windows, nice windows, glass doors, amazing success stories with that. Also, the St. Louis uh, Economic Development Corporation has a loan fund where they can help businesses expand and partner with the Small Business Administration. People don't know about a lot of these programs, but they do exist. All right, all politics may be local, but there's a lot of change uh, happening in this country at the state and federal levels right now, uh, some of which have uh, changes at the federal level have engendered uh, complaints this week from mayors around the country, especially on issues of immigration. Um, and I ask this also because uh, Mayor Francis Slay, some would say, was not a very visible uh, figure on the national scene, as other city mayors seem to, including mayors in Kansas City, have much more of an interest in national urban policy. Um, before we delve into maybe more specifics, one issue that could be coming to the forefront, we asked Vlada Cruz in this uh, last time, is the, the prospect that a Trump administration might ask uh, the mayors of cities to use local police forces to enforce whatever immigration policy du jour, or executive order du jour and deportation or, uh, or immigration might be on the table. If your mayor and attorney general by then Jeffrey Beauregard Sessions calls you and says, we need St. Louis's help to round up illegal immigrants, what will you do? I mean, we, we've talked about sanctuary cities here and you know, it's, Obviously, a lot of people think there's no chance of us becoming one officially because of the Missouri General Assembly, but there's a letter of the law and the spirit, right? So yeah. it might come down to the mayor. It's kind of like, let's do it not. Um, I would, I support, you know, our new immigrants that are coming to this country. And I think the city of St. Louis has more pressing and emerging issues than rounding up illegal immigrants. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't see using resources to do that. It's counterproductive. All right. Okay, uh, I uh -oh. spent quite a part of the day, not the better part, some part of the day, uh, looking at financial stuff, because I, I do a weekly account for stlmag.com on the mayor's race. And um, looking at your uh, money, um, it's as, maybe I don't have the right, most uh, January 17th report, Money on hand is $34,263, $34,263, which to me is a lot of money. But when you're running for mayor, it's not a lot of money. I mean, it's, it's a lot of money, but Lida has 400 something thousand, Tashara has $200,000. Tell us about how difficult it is and what a drag it is to raise money to run for office. Because I can't imagine anything worse than that to me, calling people up asking for money so you can help. It's like you're selling yourself for that money. But you got to do to get the badge you got on or the direct mail piece or anything. Tell us about that process and how difficult it is. Um, well, certainly raising money is a difficult process, but it's not as hard as people think. Because if you get people to believe in you and you can really inspire people, people are willing to give and they're willing to donate. And although we have what looks like a small amount, but a big amount to other people, money is steady coming in. You know, we have up until election day to collect money. So if you want to send money, go to www.com <laughs> and hit the donate button. Um, yeah, we're excited about it. Um, it, it. It's taxing, though, I'll tell you. I um, mean, spending hours a day on the telephone, smiling and dialing, it, it gets to be pretty taxing. But when I spent four years as an Army recruiter, I learned how to smile and dial very well. And the other thing, too, about that, Hillary outspent Trump two to one. Yeah. So just because you have more money doesn't mean you actually going to win. Right. But I would ask you about one donation. I, I just, it's, not, it's a good donation. I just want you to bring a few minutes on this. You got 500 bucks from the Goody Goody Diner. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the Goody Goody Diner on Metro <laughs> Branch, okay? 
Oh it's man, a great place. the Goody Goody Diner is a phenomenal place. It's a staple in the 22nd Ward. It's certainly one institution that I'm proud of. Um, the, the Safis that own Goody Goody, uh, I don't know, some people may know the Connellys actually sold it a couple of years or so ago, but they're doing a great job. They've done a lot of expansions. Uh, I was excited, even though I didn't get a chance to see them. The vice president was there supporting Candor. In, in, oh, really? Yes, in October, I believe it was. And um, it's always a happening, happening place. Uh, I go in there, people see me, I feel like a celebrity. And then sometimes I can't go as much because I get stuff to do. You know? <laughs> right, right, right. But uh, yeah, Goody Goody is a. Place. Yeah. Oh, usually politicians and preachers and yeah. But it's, it's, it's a good place to hang out. Oh, no. If you've never been to Goody Goody, right. you need to check it out. <laughs> 5900 Natural Bridge, Goody Goody Drive In. All right. Institution just like the Royale here. But no. the DJ's asking for more beer. You can't imagine anything worse than having to dial for money, but how about having to moderate campaign forms for free beer? Um, it's a struggle. No. Anyway, um, so Jeffrey, when you're mayor, you will have power over appointments um, to staff positions, and some of your opponents have called or immediately said they will uh, terminate the police chief, Sam Dotson. You don't have to talk about Sam Dotson, but. Um, Maybe more philosophically, what will your approach be to who is in there when you take office? Because given their holdovers from incumbents and at all levels, usually holdovers don't survive just as a matter of uh, philosophical differences. Sure. Uh, and and I, beyond staff, too, how will you look at some of the appointments on commissions, which you can't get rid of, but those appointments do come up every year on, on cycles. So you'll have the chance to... So put your people in place, so to speak. So we have a lot of slave people there now. Right. Well, well, certainly as a new mayor, the greatest opportunity you have is to build a good team around you so that you can increase the quality of life of people in the city of St. Louis. So I would be looking forward to that. As it relates to the police, number one, we need to make sure that we have a public safety director that's very experienced in public safety. That's number one. And yeah, I hear people say, I'm going to fire Chief Dotson on day one. Well, the reality is you can't. Uh, the chief is a civil service position, and you will be in court if you on day one tell the chief that he has to go. Now, I'm a process person, and I believe in giving people chances. Um, Chief Dyson has not, never had an opportunity to work for me. So uh, one of the things that I learned in the military, if you want people to achieve excellence in their profession, you must give them a roadmap for success. And you must have an improvement plan available when they're not meeting certain benchmarks. And so I would have an expectation about decreasing crime and better patrols in our neighborhoods. And if the current chief are not, is not meeting those, and then he basically ends up, you know, removing himself because there is a process to remove civil service employees if they're not, you know, making the mark. Mm. But there is something called due process, and I certainly would be responsible enough to use due process. Okay, this is a bit of a curveball it's from the audience, but uh, it relates to, in I would say, the general topic would be. In environmental racism, I guess you might say. This is a quote question. I know it's not within the city limits, but the burning of the Bridgeton landfill is alarming a lot of people in the St. Louis region. As mayor of St. Louis, do you think you could affect change there? And is that a problem you, you feel urgency about? Or for that matter, do you see it as a mayor's issue at all? Well, certainly I think um, the mayor should weigh in on that issue. We own the airport, basically. It's out by the airport. And I think the mayor needs to get involved and to speak out against it because all lives matter. And there's that environmental issue in St. Louis County let the wind blow and it affects St. Louis City residents. So it's really a regional problem. And as mayor, what I want to do is work with the county executive on strategies for really collaborating in our region and making our region a much better region. I'm interested in getting to know every mayor, all 90 of them, in St. Louis County so that we can understand each other and work more collaboratively. I'm so disappointed that Chesterfield, you know, thinks so highly of St. Louis, right? I mean, they basically said, we don't want St. Louis, we don't want to be part of St. Louis, and that's, that's pretty troubling. And we need to change that paradigm. And it takes real leadership that's when the roll sleeves up and get out there and connect with people and show people that city of St. Louis is a great place to live, work, and play. Following right up on that, um, 
New paradigm, some have suggested, includes the city joining the county as a municipality, the city and the county merging, the city seceding and becoming part of the state of Illinois, <laughs> the city becoming its own independent city-state. Do any of those new paradigms appeal to Mayor Jeffrey Boyd? Here's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in collaboration. There's been a lot of talk for some years about a city-county mer merger, but quite honestly, I don't see it happening for quite some time because of how we do business, the status quo, right? If we start dating St. Louis County and we start doing things collaboratively, we can show the region and we can show the world that we can actually work together. Since I've been alderman for about 10 years, I've been connecting with each mayor of the city of Wellston and talking to the County uh, Economic Development Council about doing a major economic development project from Wellston to city limits. How can we recreate that Wellston shopping district? See, that's what I see. What a huge opportunity. And if we can show that we can work together on that, then we can show that we can work together on housing. Wellston, if you look at Wellston, it basically looks like my neighborhood, practically. There's a lot of opportunities to build new housing buildings in the city of Wellston. Why can't we get together and leverage our federal resources and build hundreds of houses in Wellston and just for an example in the 22nd Ward at the same time, showing the spirit of collaboration and cooperation. I think it will make a huge impact on our region and it will really show great leadership. So you're saying it's hard to get back together after being divorced 141 years? Well, you gotta get back with the right one. Okay. Uh, and looking up stuff on your website, one of the bills that you said you were uh, trying to give pref give a bill that would give preference to hiring veterans for city jobs. Also on your website, it also talked about a tree planting program on vacant lots that you, uh, give me an example of a bill that you wanted to get through that you thought was a good idea that didn't get passed and why it didn't get passed and maybe one that did get passed and why that got passed. Well, to the best example I can give you of a bill that finally got passed, you know, for years, we had a cruising problem in, in St. Louis City. Um, and it became a real headache for us in the 22nd War several years ago, where people would cruise, young people would cruise from Fairground Park all the way to Natural Bridge and Goodfellow. And it was kind of like a parking lot. I mean, I would be there on a Sunday and emergency vehicles couldn't get by. Uh, people would leave all kind of trash. You know, later on, it was a headache for the city of St. Louis, a drain on our, our resources, having to come and clean up. It was almost like an unauthorized parade. And the people in my neighborhood were frustrated. I mean, people were doing things in their, on their garages and in their yards that were inappropriate. So what I decided to do was inter introduce an anti-cruising bill. That was very oh. tough. Yeah, that was a very tough bill to get passed. And, um, it had been, they had tried it for years before and it never got passed. So I had the opportunity to get the votes and I'm so proud of myself on this issue. Um, I went against the president, President Reed, on this issue. What, what, what was some of the pushback you got against it? What other people against it? I, I just think someone had, uh, some of the alderman had the mindset that it was okay. And just kids cruising. What's yeah, the like what's the problem? But it really had a negative impact on public safety, and it wasn't right. So I pushed it through, and there were some hard feelings, and we worked it out. So the bill went to the perfection calendar. Or it passed perfection, and it went to the third reading final passage calendar. But we got together. And we as who? Uh, the president and I, and we came up with a compromise. So I sent the bill back to the perfection calendar so he can get what he wanted out of the bill. What did he want out of the bill? Man, that was some years ago. I have to go back and look at the amendment. But whatever it was, whatever process it was, you know, we did it. And that's called the win-win. And in politics, most people know me. I live by the code of a win-win. I think it's a lot better if both of us can walk away feeling like we got something than one of us getting nothing. And so the bill went back to perfection. It got the amendment. It went. It passed again. And it was third read. Finally passed. What was so great about that is once we start posting signs up anti-cruising, it just kind of went away. 
It was a drain on our law enforcement resources. So our neighborhoods were not being serviced in the way that they should have been serviced. And so we reallocated all of that back into the neighborhoods. We had businesses that had to hire off-duty police officers at the gas stations, at Burger King, at Taco Bell, because people just posted up on their parking lot, played their music as if it was a park. And it all went away. And so I'm so proud of that. And I'm proud of the fact that I was able to compromise I'm proud of the fact that I created better public safety opportunities in our neighborhood, and the neighborhood was happy about it. Right, what about one that didn't work out? A bill that you pushed and just couldn't get through for whatever reason. You know, there's a bill right now that I'm working on, and still in the midst, that's a, a challenging bill. We have an issue with illegal dumping in my neighborhood. I'm talking about hundreds of tires dumped on a vacant lot or behind buildings throughout our, my neighborhood and throughout many other neighborhoods across the city, both north and south. And I introduced the bill in order to regulate the tire industry. But the challenge became with the the, the good guys, you know, the good year and the, the, the mom and pop tire shops has been doing it right for many years. They felt that like they were being penalized. And so I kind of backed off on it, but I'm still thinking about, you know, how we can, you know, create this ordinance or this bill that we can actually regulate the tire industry where we don't have to spend hundreds of thousand dollars a year getting rid of these illegal dump tires. All right. New um, question just in, keep sending them up here. We've got some time. Um, Lida Cruson received the endorsement of the Police Officers Association, um, one of our two police unions. There's also the Ethical Society of Police. We started uh, the discussion last time with her on those issues. Um, you have a, a very sort of a spirited and detailed uh, platform on policing. Um, I guess I have a few questions related to that. One is, did you seek the endorsement of the Police Officers Association or the Ethical Society of, of Police? Um, the second part is, you, you do call for 100 new officers, um, and you are calling for community policing. I wonder if you could maybe sketch that out a little uh, further for us. What, what do you mean by that? And then also how we're going to pay for 100 new officers. Well, first of all, we already have the money for 100 new officers. We're understaffed, and we're overworking the officers that are there now. I mean, all this overtime, we're not getting 100% of them. I mean, there's no way you can work 12 hours a day and be 100%. So we need to get them adequately staffed. That's important. It's, it's important for their mental well-being. Community policing is very important to me. You know, I envision a police department that's decentralized. Right now, we have a three stations, area stations. And it's hard for residents to get to the police station. You know, I'm looking for strategies to bring the police closer to the community. I'm looking for opportunities for police in all neighborhoods to be on bike patrols and foot patrols, get closer connected with the community. And it's gonna be a challenge, but I think we can do it because I see, I see it happening. And I know that people, when they see the police officers walking and talking and communicating with them, they feel better. Mm -hmm. And it's just something I'm committed to. All right. Okay. Uh, two new questions from the audience here. Um, as mayor, how will you change the way the city services are delivered so aldermen can spend their time legislating instead of tape tracking down streets, forestry, and other departments to fix constituent complaints? Oh, good question. Well, first of all, my first 100 days, what I want to do is I want to drill down in every department in city government. I want to know what are they doing right and where are their, what are their weaknesses? Because we need to elevate what they're doing right and minimize the weaknesses. We need to be very efficient in our delivery of services. One of the challenges and the frustrations that I have is that departments don't communicate with each other. If a forestry, if a, whether it's a forestry driver or a refuse driver, I'll give you an example. So the refuse driver is driving down the alley and he sees tires illegally dumped. My expectation is that refuse driver will make the complaint. I mean, it's probably in a department that he works in anyway. We shouldn't have to wait for constituents when, when we work for the city and we see problems. We need to make sure that the Citizen Service Bureau, that we have an adequate tracking, an accurate tracking 
of the complaints and the resolve. Far too often, we are told that problems have been resolved and they have not been resolved. So we need to tighten up in that particular service and making sure that each department is delivering like they're supposed to. Because it's so frustrating when Mrs. Jones tells me I've called three times about that illegal dump and no one has come to do anything. I would be a mayor that demands quality service. The people are paying for it and they deserve it. All right, I have an audience question. It also resonates with um, other questions and statements out there right now. Um, one of the other candidates talks about being a mayor of both sides of Delmar. The Delmar divide has been in local lore for decades. Um, what has long been a racial dividing line today seems almost as much a dividing line between two very different qualities of life. Obviously, um, there are more African Americans now living south of Del Mar than north, but there is a crucial difference in what you see, the level of businesses and services, city services, the amount of vacancy on both sides. So it is still a very real divide line. This question from the audience is, in your first 100 days, what will you do to facilitate a real dialogue between North and South of Del Mar residents? Sure, great question. Well, as mayor, here's what I envision, because I want to be a mayor for all people and really connect with people as I do as alderman. As alderman, I really have my finger on the pulse of what's going on in my neighborhood. And what I'm committed to as mayor is having two town hall meetings so that I'm accessible and I have an opportunity to listen to residents. And I want to make sure I provide opportunities for residents both north and south to come together and have construction, constructive dialogue. And I think what else is important is that we come up with a, a committee or a commission who's charged with going out there and actually connecting residents with each other. We will not fix our racial divide until we have the hard conversations. The problem is we're not having those conversations. So as mayor, I want to push to make sure that we're having those hard conversations so we can overcome these cultural barriers. Having served in the military, I've had the opportunity to serve both in the United States, from the East Coast to the West Coast and overseas. And I've had a chance to experience all different type of cultures and it's helped me be a better person today. Sometime when you don't know someone, you're not sure of how you actually can communicate with them. And because there's so many cultural biases and stereotypes that have been handed down from generation, it's hard to break through, but what I do know, if you can put people in the right spaces and get them to talk, you can build some really good friendships and relationships. And that's what's going to make St. Louis stronger. If we can have those hard, tough conversations and really work collaboratively together with one another. Just a quick follow-up. Um, a commission that's looked at some of these issues on an even bigger scale is the Ferguson Commission with a large report, many recommendations. Anything in that report jump out as something that should be a priority for the next mayor? Well, th there's nothing in the report that, that really surprises me. When I look at the challenges that I have in my neighborhood, I just keep asking the question, why does it have to be so hard? Why can't we just do the right thing? When we talk about public safety and we talk about crime, it seems like we're just walking around it. It's not that difficult. If we start rebuilding and focusing on these neighborhoods, when we start rebuilding these neighborhoods, we can create job opportunities for people that live in these neighborhoods. We can elevate the quality of life of people in those neighborhoods. And I'm committed to making sure that we have a plan that's tailor-made for the city of St. Louis and that we implement it. That is what's important to me. Okay, I've said this before on stlmag.com and on my podcast too, I think the point is, follows up somewhat the topic you just mentioned. Racism exists. There's obviously there's no question about that. We're not post-racial at all. Uh, racial disparity in, in this metropolitan region. The median household income on blacks is thirty-three thousand uh, dollars. For whites is sixty-two thousand dollars. So it's almost double. Uh, education disparity all exists. But I still don't see. 2017 the same as 1993 in terms of mural politics, although race is still an issue. This is a question, that's my preface to this question here. Uh, this is the question of the audience. It is rumored that you were in this race with the intention of dividing the black vote to aid Lida's candidacy. Critics say shared donors makes this evident. What is your response to this criticism? 
Wow, Sherrod Donors makes this evidence. I don't know if Good Goody Goody gave the letter or not. I I, oh, I, well, I I don't think so. Well, the fact is, there are donors that give to all kids. Exactly. That's number one. Number two is absolutely absurd, and I'm offended when people say that. I am a man of great integrity. I am my own man. I don't need someone to tell me what to do. I, I'm a soldier. I'm a real soldier. Okay, I've been on the battlefield for the 22nd War for 14 years. I have, I have inalienable rights, they call it, in the Constitution, right? I have a right to run for public office if I choose to. And anybody that decides that it's not my time and that I shouldn't and I'm helping somebody else, I mean, it's just absurd. I mean, it's absolutely absurd. But it's a good strategy for someone who thinks they're losing because then you say, oh, he's just in it to, to divide. He's just in it to do this. You know, we can't trust him. Don't vote for him. But ladies and gentlemen, don't drink the Kool-Aid. Don't believe the hype. It's all false. I am not out here working like crazy, going to bed at midnight, forsaking my family because I want to help somebody else win. I've run for citywide office twice because I know it's going to come up again. And here's what I have to say about that. Quitters never win and winners never quit. I love my city. And I run for public office because I care about people. And I am the only candidate in this race who have done the tough stuff, who have rolled my sleeves up and taken on the tough challenges. Why would I want to take all my gifts and just throw it away and go through some mental gymnastics to run for mayor just to help somebody else? Do you know how difficult it is and how tiring it is to run around and do events every day? I'm not doing this for greens and giggles, ladies and gentlemen. I'm doing this to win, and I plan to win on March the 7th. So let's get that out of your head that I'm here to help Lyda Cruzan or Tashara Jones or French or anybody else. I'm here to help Jeffrey Boyd. All right. All right. Great. We're going to wrap it up soon. I think one more question. Got a closing statement. All right. My, my question um, Depending on what happens in March and depending on whether or not we have term limits, you could end up being mayor in 2023 when we redistrict the Board of Aldermen from 28 to 14 wards. The last time this was done, it was pretty tame. The time before that was sort of a national um, conflagration of sorts. Um, but I won't get into the details. If you weren't around for that, you can find the YouTube video quite embarrassing led to the defeat of the president of the board of aldermen jim shrewsbury giving us president reed who's now running for mayor as mayor what can you do in that process because in 2001 it was widely reputed that francis slave's staff had pretty much drawn those division lines which created a lot of the conflict um but that's not to say the mayor doesn't have a role to play to bring people together and streamline the process often something from outside shows a truth that can't be found from inside. One of the other candidates said there should be an independent commission. Some aldermen probably would prefer to, to cast, the, to divide the spoils up themselves. But what can you do? Wow. And I know you might have to go back to the board in a couple of weeks, so we'll be gentle. No, I tell you, the best seat to have is in room 200 when that happens. Because what I see happening is a lot of people who were friends are not gonna be friends. <laughs> It's going to be every man and woman for themselves, and people are going to be cutting deals like crazy, and there is going to be a lot of hurt feelings. The only thing that the mayor can do is provide some leadership and making sure that there's a balance of power. One of the biggest challenges that we have with reducing the Board of Aldermen to 14 is there potentially will be a racial disparity on representation. And that is a real issue that we need to look at. And we need to make sure that it is a fair process and that it was equitable. So that's gonna be a big challenge. But being inside the Board of Aldermen, I don't think they're gonna to listen much to the mayor on how this works out, okay? <laughs> because like I said, every man and woman is gonna be for themselves. Wow. Just quickly, how will it be different when there's 14 aldermen as opposed to 28? Well, here's what I can imagine. Just give me a hypothetical. The 22nd ward could be merged with the first ward. Instead of having 
a third of the ward vacant, you might have 50% of the ward vacant. You're gonna have twice the headaches. It's not gonna be a good time to be an alderman in certain areas of the city because you're gonna be compounded with these issues. Part of the discussion that has we haven't had is, you know, secretarial staff. You know, should the alderman be a full-time alderman, a real full-time alderman with a secretary and with a full-time salary? I don't see happy days, you know, if we have 14 aldermen. And I'm being serious with you. You know, there's gonna be a lot of challenges in how the capital improvement money would be distributed. Right now it's distributed very evenly and that's not necessarily a fair process because you said you have some wards like mine that has a huge geography, a lot of streets and alleys, and you have some that are pretty dense and they're compact, like the 28th ward, and you don't have as many. And it's only about maybe two or three wards that are like that. But a ward like mine that has all that geography, $300,000 for capital improvements, that's almost nothing to you. So there's a lot to think about and we really need to be forward thinking in that process now and not just wait to 2021 to deal with it. This is my last thing here. You voted against the NFL stadium, correct? Or am I wrong on that? Time is going. The Ram, so the Ram stadium. Did you vote for it or again? I don't remember if I voted on it. I, was I there? Maybe against it, maybe against it. I thought you were against it. You voted okay. against it. The time, I was just going to ask, that, what did you see in that that you were worried about and opposed it as opposed to uh, others? Because a lot of people voted for it. Well, here, here were some of the challenges that was with it. And this is what I kind of just felt that Conkey, that owned the Rams, did not care what the city of St. Louis was going to do. He was going to move anyway. And I thought that we were just going through you know, so an academic exercise, and it was not going to be fruitful. And that's exactly what happened. It bared no fruit. That's true. All right, we're, we're coming to the end, so I'm going to ask the last question, which also opens the final statement. So say we're here four years from now, and DJ and I are still doing this glorious we're still job. Getting, we're still getting free beer. Still getting free beer. Okay, You're running for re-election, and we say, well, Mayor Boyd, Summarize the last four years in office. What will you tell the crowd here? Well, I, but this is what I would tell the crowd. I'm excited about keeping my commitment to making sure that all the distressed neighborhoods, the three distressed neighborhoods that we talked about and we agreed upon, have hundreds of new homes and that crime is down. I would be excited about running for re-election by saying we have created new industries in the city of St. Louis and people have opportunities to get very good jobs and people feel safe in the city of St. Louis and they see the city of St. Louis as a destination place. I would say that our educational system because of my advocacy in Jefferson City is at a higher standard than it was four years ago because they've taken it to the next level. I would say I've committed myself to taking care of the homeless and we don't have as many homeless people living on the streets of the city of St. Louis like we once did. I would say that I'm proud of the relationship that the police department has with the community because of the community engagement process and the retraining that they've gone through. I would say, ladies and gentlemen, you should reelect me because I'm a man of integrity, I'm about my word, I've kept my word, and we have more work to do. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Alderman Boyd. Thank you all who have attended and asked questions and participated. We'll be back here in two Mondays on the 13th with Aldermanic President Mayoral Hopeful Lewis Reed and closing it out on the 20th with Antonio French. Um, the live stream will become a YouTube video and a podcast. You can still register to vote. Yeah. You can still register to vote, right? It's the first week of February, I think, so don't mind. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I'm more focused and good at that than I am right, right like now. A month, a month in advance. A month in advance, so there's still time. So please participate. Um, check this all out on the Royale's website where you can find the past episodes as podcasts. Thanks to Bill Streeter again. Thanks to Steve Smith. Thanks to DJ Wilson and Jeffrey Boyd. Thanks to everybody in advance for voting on March 7th. We'll see you again in two weeks. Jeffrey Boyd for Mayor, 314 333 6065. Smile and die. Wow. That was